Good afternoon. Welcome to the Victim Council Coordination Part 2 Preserving Victim Rights Webinar. All of our participants are currently in listening-only mode. To listen to today's presentation, you will need to connect the audio from your computer via the platform. Please click the audio symbol at the top of your screen and ensure it is green. If you just entered the room, take a moment to check the volume on your computer. If you require audio via telephone or you have a technical question for us, please type your question into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen or send us an email at bjantac at ojt.usdoj.gov. If you require closed, closed captioning, please click the link on the welcome slide. As a note, we will be recording this webinar today and the presentation slides will be distributed to all attendees following the webinar. To kick off our event today, I will turn it first to Sasha Beatty from the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sasha Beatty, and I am Deputy General Counsel at Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. APA is a private nonprofit located in Washington, D.C., serving prosecutors as well as their law enforcement and community partners. Thank you for joining this capital litigation webinar today. This presentation is made possible by Grant 2018 CPBX K002, awarded by the Office of Justice Programs through Bureau of Justice Assistance Capital Case Litigation Initiative. APA is very appreciative of their financial assistance and commitment to improving the justice system. Additionally, a thanks to BJA's National Training and Technical Assistance Center for providing the platform for today's webinar. Points of view or opinions in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Department of Justice or the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. Now, today's webinar will be presented by Randall Udelman of the Arizona Crime Victim Rights Law Group. Randall S. Udelman is a native Arizona resident who was born and raised in Paradise Valley, Arizona, and currently is in private practice at the law firm Udelman, Udelman Firm, PLC. Randall has been an attorney in private practice since 1991, practicing in the areas of plaintiff's insurance, bad faith litigation, commercial disputes, product liability, personal injury litigation, and, most significantly here, crime victim assistance. As a part of his victim practice, Randall, Randall regularly advocates for changes in Arizona law for the benefit of crime victims and often provides amicus support for various victim-centric issues on appeal. Randall and other victim organizations advocated for new legislation creating a crime victim representation fund in Arizona, allowing crime victims to access free legal services paid out solely from criminal fines and assessments. And with that, I will now turn it over to our presenter. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. And I certainly hope that uh, the, the uh, presentation today is informative, and, and I hope it would be interactive. If there are any particular questions as we go through the presentation today, there is a dialog box that you can type in a question, and, and I certainly hope that I'll have an opportunity to review the question, to read it out loud for the benefit of the recorded record, and then as best as I can answer it as we move along. Um, our organization, the Arizona Crime Victim Rights Law Group, provides lawyers to crime victims at no cost to them as they work their way through the criminal justice system. Uh, we start our work formally as counsel of record, at least in Arizona, uh, when an indictment or direct complaint has been issued or filed. But we certainly know that uh, there are issues before a notice of appearance is filed, and if asked, we become involved beforehand to act as a resource for victims of crime who work their way through the criminal justice system. In the course of these slides and this presentation, I'll talk about victim rights as we know them in Arizona. I, I realize that there are other jurisdictions that are involved in today's call, but I'm hopeful that some of the issues that we present and the resources that we talk about at least might be able to act as a helpful roadmap to approaching issues in your respective jurisdiction. And at the end of the presentation, I'll uh, certainly have my contact information, our organization uh, phone number, our organization email address, 
and we're certainly happy to follow up if there are any, any specific jurisdiction-related questions that we might be able to help with. Uh, uh, we do regularly work with national organizations and, and certainly other states as questions arise. Uh, and also at the end of the presentation, I'll try and uh, present a hypothetical uh, crime and some of the issues and best practice tips that I can recommend that hopefully would help victims as they face the unknown uh, and bear the burden of having to deal with loss. Again, my name is Randall Udelman. I'm a victim rights attorney with the Arizona Crime Victim Rights Law Group. Part of the reason for today's uh, presentation is to kind of identify differences in victim rights when punishment in particular involves capital punishment or the death penalty. Uh, I'm giving my perspectives as a victim rights lawyer in hopes of uh, kind of sharing thoughts as the uh, process moves forward from a more of a victim-centric perspective. And to start off, we've got to uh, specify what is a capital crime. And in Arizona, I'll uh, specifically uh, talk about what Arizona defines as a capital or as a crime that's eligible for capital punishment. First of all, it's first-degree murder, and a jury has to reach that conclusion that the person's conduct will and indeed uh, causes death of another as a result of premeditation and deliberation. Uh, the defendant has to be at least 18 years of age at the time of the offense, and there have to be either special circumstances that I believe are described in other jurisdictions, but in Arizona it's aggravating circumstances. Some of those aggravating factors would be, for example, whether a defendant actually tried to pay for the murder, a murder for hire, uh, whether the offense has been committed in an especially heinous or cruel and depraved manner, whether it's been uh, committed while a defendant was in custody or on probation for another felony offense, whether the victim was a peace officer. Uh, those are the types of factors that lead to a conclusion that uh, uh, an offense is capital eligible. In Arizona, we also have a three-part process, all of which require a jury trial determination for each, each phase. The first phase is guilt, whether or not the uh, particular uh, uh, defendant uh, was guilty of first-degree murder involving uh, aggravating, or, or excuse me, involving premeditation. The second phase of the trial is the aggravation phase and whether those particular factors are um, uh, present, and it's, again, a jury uh, determination. And then the third phase, if there is aggravating circumstances that were proven by the jury, uh, the penalty phase, whether the defendant is appropriately uh, going to be punished uh, by capital punishment or natural life. That's the process that Arizona defendants go through in making a determination of whether to impose capital punishment or not. So what are victim rights and when did they attach, and in particular with, it, with respect to a capital case? In Arizona, we have the Victim Bill of Rights that's spelled out in the Arizona Constitution. And in other states across the country, it's uh, uh, several jurisdictions adopted uh, Marcy's Law, which is uh, 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 the, I believe it's the founder of the Broadcom Company, that uh, uh, he, uh, the founder of that Broadcom company lost his child and made a, a concerted effort to allow different states and different jurisdictions across the country to have similar constitutional victim rights in other jurisdictions. I believe it's about 35 states that now have either Marcy's Law in effect or some form of a Victim Bill of Rights that protect victims uh, in further in, in connection with the uh, criminal justice system. Some of those rights, are the, at least in Arizona, are the rights to be treated with fairness, respect, and dignity, to be free from intimidation, harassment, or abuse throughout the criminal justice process, the rights to be informed when the accused or convicted person is released from custody or escaped, the right to be present and informed of all criminal proceedings when a uh, particular defendant has the right to be present, the right to be heard at any proceeding involving a post-arrest decision, 
a negotiated plea or sentencing, the right to, to refuse an interview, uh, deposition, or other, other uh, discovery requests by the defendant or a defense attorney or an investigator for a defendant, the right to confer with the prosecutor after the crime has been charged before trial or before any disposition and to be informed of the disposition of the case, the right to review pre-sentence reports relating to the crime, and the right to receive prompt restitution that caused the loss or injury. Uh, in addition, the victim has the right to be heard in any proceeding when there's a post-conviction release from confinement that's considered. And then the victim also has, uh, in our jurisdiction, the right to a speedy trial. Now, nationally, the uh, Crime Victim Rights Act have similar protections available for the victim. The right to be reasonably protected from the accused, the right to reasonable, accurate, and timely notice of court proceedings, the right not to be excluded from public proceedings unless there's some clear and convincing evidence as to why they should be excluded, the right to be reasonably heard at any public proceeding, the right to confer with the attorney for the government, the right to speedy and timely restitution, and the right to be free from unreasonable delay, as well as under the uh, Crime Victim Rights Act, the federal protection, the victim has similar rights to be treated with overall fairness and respect for dignity and privacy. As I mentioned, Marcy's Law across the country also has provided a similar foundation for a series of constitutional protection and rights across the country. And as mentioned earlier, I believe now 35 states have some variation of constitutional protections in place for victim rights. And I would say that uh, there has long been a movement underway to uh, provide those similar protections under federal law and the federal constitution. Typically, early on in the prosecution, the rights require assistance with uh, uh, victim compensation fund issues, grief counseling, conferring with prosecutors about what punishment should be imposed, whether there's bond reduction hearings if a defense motion has been filed, and helping begin the process of uh, preparing a victim impact statement. The rights formally attached, at least in Arizona, after the defendant has been formally charged, uh, the issues with respect to grief counseling and compensation fund claims typically come up sooner rather than later. The issues involving discussions with prosecutors about the type of punishment typically comes up sooner rather than later. And then after indictment or after a direct complaint, uh, there are, are certainly bond reduction issues and requests for interviews that, that would come up. The uh, uh, start of a case, however, one of the main issues that come up uh, is whether or not a uh, victim wants to see a case go to either capital punishment or non-capital punishment. And those are the types of issues that uh, at least develop early on in, in litigation in the criminal justice system. The difference with respect to victim rights in non-capital cases I'll, I'll, I'd like to talk about a little bit right now. First of all, there's uh, typically when <clears throat> the uh, defendant faces the ultimate punishment of death, there are uh, more rights afforded to them, rights that typically uh, uh, in non-capital cases would be limited. For example, uh, if a defense attorney reached out and made a request for a victim interview and said that that particular interview was essential to their preparation of a case for trial, or if they believed that they had an absolute right uh, to obtain discovery of certain uh, uh, confidential medical records, those types of requests uh, are certainly going to be considered at least in our jurisdiction, differently in a non-capital case, and more likely than not, victim rights would prevent a uh, discovery or witness interview of a, or victim interview uh, as the case is preparing uh, or moving forward to trial. There's also uh, differences in sentencing after a guilt 
in aggravation phase of a trial are completed. For example, a judge rather than a jury imposes the sentence in a non-capital case. Victim opinions on what the proper sentence should be are considered by the judge in a non-capital case. Victims have the right in our jurisdiction to present evidence, information, as well as opinions on the proper sentencing. Victims can also rely on written statements and, and videos and photographs as they present an opinion about sentencing. And those statements, those videos, those photographs, uh, all of that information are not subject to any disclosure or cross-examination uh, when it comes to a uh, defendant. Uh, now, the state and defense certainly have an opportunity uh, to explain or support or deny whatever it is that the victim uh, presents in an impact statement. So the state and defense, uh, they, can, they can explain, support, or deny details spelled out in a victim impact statement, but a victim has no obligation in a non-capital case, uh, or for that matter, in a capital case, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, to that information beforehand. Uh, what are the victim rights and what are the differences in, in a capital case? I think I mentioned earlier the, there's a difference in trial. Uh, all three phases of a capital case would typically involve a jury unless there's a waiver by the defendant. There's guilt, then there's aggravation, mitigation, and then there's a penalty phase of a trial. Discovery efforts to secure victim information would typically be analyzed differently. Uh, there is a pending case in Arizona's uh, federal district court about uh, restrictions on requests to interview a victim, for example. If it's in a capital case, I, I believe, although the law specifically says that the victim has a right to interview or to refuse an interview request, I, I believe judges would typically analyze the implications differently if the case involved potential for capital punishment. And um, uh, I can certainly envision a scenario where a judge might uh, balance the defendant's constitutional rights in a capital case compared to a victim's state-based constitutional rights and err on the side of allowing an interview. Uh, I haven't seen that before, but I certainly can see that that might be an issue in the uh, uh, in the appropriate case, and I certainly uh, am not suggesting as a victim rights attorney that that should ever come up, but, it's, um, but, but it is uh, worth talking about a little bit. Um, and the difference also when it comes to capital cases is what a victim can and cannot say at sentencing. We know that impact statements actually can rebut mitigation evidence presented by a defendant during an aggravation phase of a case. What a victim can say is information about uh, the family, about the relationship with the lost loved one, about the um, uh, uh, details about their loss. The mitigation evidence that a defendant presents Therefore, it is certainly um, a victim can talk about the nature of the relationship with uh, their, their son or daughter, their sibling, their parent, their loss. They can talk about that person. They can talk about the relationship between themselves and that person, that uh, the decedent, and they can talk about how this has affected them personally. Those statements are relevant to re, uh, rebut mitigation evidence during an aggravation phase of the trial, and those uh, statements are relevant to what an appropriate penalty is at trial. But victims cannot talk about whether they want to see the, uh, the death penalty imposed in, this particular, uh, in their particular case. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has limited the type of victim impact evidence at sentencing, and it's certainly admissible, but it's, um, it's unfairly prejudicial if they make recommendations about punishment. Statements 
need to be analyzed with that uh, potential in mind. The, the, um, uh, the, the, the question is whether or not a particular victim impact statement is so unduly prejudicial that it represents and renders the trial as uh, one that is fundamentally unfair. So I always need to meet with our clients and tell our clients we have to be careful what we do as victim rights lawyers because ultimately we can talk about the relationship between the victim and, and, and the survivor uh, and their decedent uh, uh, son, daughter, parent, sister, brother. We can talk about how the loss has affected them personally. We can use photographs. We can use video. We can use PowerPoint presentations. But we have to be real careful not to push that limit. And the limit is if it's so unduly prejudicial that it renders the trial fundamentally unfair, that's the standard under Arizona law, and that also is uh, the type of standard under U.S. Supreme Court. I believe it's Payne versus Tennessee. And uh, so it's generally allowable, but we advise victims uh, not to push the limits. We want to make sure that the trial doesn't have so uh, unduly prejudicial victim impact evidence that it has to happen more than once, uh, especially after having gone through such a traumatic experience with trial in the first place. Um, one of the areas that we see come up is when a defendant, through counsel, tries to make a claim for mitigation and cites, for example, an argument of diminished capacity and hires an expert, and that expert is used to uh, uh, somehow mitigate uh, the potential um, uh, penalty uh, or potentially mitigate the aggravating factors that might uh, have been alleged by the state. We argue that under these circumstances, mitigation reports uh, should be produced to the victim, at least victim counsel, because we, we believe in order to effectively advocate and confer with prosecutors, we have the right to understand what it is that would come up at trial. And if there are mitigation expert reports that somehow support either a defense uh, rejecting aggravation, if it's mitigation, or if it's a uh, uh, in the uh, uh, penalty phase, if it's arguing for natural life versus capital punishment, the impact or expert witness reports should be produced to crime victims to facilitate their constitutional right to confer with the prosecution before trial. Otherwise, how can a victim know what is going to happen at trial, what to say in connection with their impact evidence, what steps they should take to further their rights without understanding what expert mitigation reports say? So we've advocated in the past, and, and we were looking actually for a case to take up to our Court of Appeals uh, to address this issue further and spell out that victims have the right in certain circumstances to disclosure and discovery of defense mitigation expert reports. And we urge that disclo disclosure is absolutely essential under certain circumstances. Otherwise, the rights that are afforded to a victim are illusory. How, how do we know what the trial is going to look like without understanding what the defense is going to say at trial? And how can we confer about a poten potential plea offer without understanding what uh, uh, what's going to happen and what uh, appeals um, might come up down the road. And, and those types of issues uh, often are spelled out in mitigation reports, and, and victims should have access to that information. As a victim right lawyer, uh, I, I'd like to suggest uh, spelling out what types of uh, suggestions to make when representing victims throughout the prosecution and in post-conviction matters. As I mentioned earlier, rights attach on indictment. 
if the death penalty looks like it might apply based on the nature of the crime, I think it's important to meet with prosecutors early on in the process to talk about the potential issues, to talk about how long the uh, process would take, what the process looks like. At least in Arizona, my understanding is it could take up to 20 years to impose capital punishment. In that process, between the time of conviction through the time capital punishment is actually um, uh, administered, involves a whole host of post-conviction issues and post-conviction relief petitions, appeals to uh, our Arizona State Court of Appeals, Arizona Supreme Court, and then there's the habeas corpus process. There's a whole host of um, uh, procedural steps, and the length of time to impose a sentence should be talked about with the victim so they understand They should also understand the procedural differences between a capital and non-capital case. As we talked about in a capital case, the the three phases, uh, guilt, aggravation, and penalty trial phases all require a jury. And um, those are the phases in Arizona. Those are certainly uh, different. They vary by jurisdiction, but those three phases exist in Arizona. And then I think it's important to talk about appeals, collateral attacks, uh, post-conviction relief, uh, what all those processes involve after conviction and the potential uh, uh, opinions that victims have on capital punishment. I think it's important to speak about what those views are and, and how victims can at least give their opinion to prosecutors on whether they have the stomach for uh, the the type of cases that might come up when it deals when the punishment is capital punishment as opposed to uh, potential punishment of natural life. Those are issues that I think it's inherent upon a victim and the prosecution to, to really talk about so that everybody knows ahead of time uh, what the victim views are, and how the state, at least the state, can consider those views in making its own decision about what to do to move forward on a particular case. And a victim needs to know what the differences in allocution are at sentencing. As we talked about earlier, impact statements from survivors about the deceased can include characteristics of the uh, sur- uh, the, the decedent, Uh, but not recommendations about sentencing. Those are not, uh, at least case law that that I've seen, uh, recommendations about sentencing are not relevant to uh, death penalty cases, but they certainly are if it's not a capital case. And and the the limits on impact statements at sentencing might be relevant to a victim, and it's important to talk about those ahead of time. Then, The issue uh, about restitution for economic loss, I always hear the stories that um, victims uh, typically don't recover any restitution, so why try? Uh, There's a U.S. Supreme Court case that talks about, uh, I mean, that frames restitution in that that manner, and and I I think that's the wrong, uh, obviously, as a victim rights lawyer, I think that's the wrong mentality. I think a victim should identify their economic loss ask for a court to award economic loss, no matter what the type of crime is. And then at uh, the appropriate point, um, after obtaining a uh, restitution award, uh, there are steps that victims can take to recover economic loss. And I'll give some examples. Um, We had, well, I I don't want to get it. I'll give a hypothetical example. A capital case involved, uh, assume the following, a capital case where a father uh, shoots his children that are uh, preschool age and grade school age and then tries to kill himself. He was successful at killing his children but not himself and ends up in a capital case. The state charges the, def- uh, the defendant with uh, capital murder trial uh, successfully leads to a verdict of guilty 
and punishment of, uh, of the death penalty. As the father was arrested, there was property taken into evidence, including valuable jewelry, including uh, some other property that had value. Uh, and the uh, analysis of restitution for economic loss uh, for uh, various expenses that the family members uh, face, have to face under those circumstances, could partially be satisfied by the property that's in custody of the police. So even though restitution might not necessarily, uh, an award of restitution in a capital case might not necessarily lead to successful recovery of all economic loss, it certainly can recover some economic loss that victims face, and we would certainly uh, suggest that that's the type of discussion that uh, needs to go into, at some point, a uh, discussion about uh, what to expect in a uh, victim rights case. Um, our organization, like I said, is the Arizona Crime Victim Rights Law Group. Our uh, website information hopefully contains details about what it is that we do and who we are, how to contact us. But our mission is to help crime victims navigate through all as aspects of the criminal justice system, both in state court and in the federal courts. We appear as victim uh, counsel of record. We assert statutory constitutional protected rights. We file notices of, of appearance, and we coordinate pretty regularly with uh, prosecutors. Uh, and we try and collaborate with prosecutors. I don't uh, ever see a, uh, a, a dispute with prosecutors. We collaborate, and we try and act as a helpful resource uh, to prosecutors as they work toward the, the goal of uh, punishment. Uh, sometimes we have a disagreement in terms of whether it should be capital punishment or non-capital punishment, but certainly uh, our job as uh, victim counsel of record is uh, to at least have an opportunity to confer with the state over what, what um, uh, whether there's a plea offer, whether there's a potential punishment that involves the death penalty, whether it involves natural life. At least we give an opportunity to express a victim rights or victim opinion over what that should be. But we also understand it's not the victim's sole opinion that the state needs to adopt moving forward on a case. And sometimes the state chooses to pursue something that we don't necessarily uh, uh, agree with. But it's never in a uh, in an unprofessional way with our organization. Our goal, though, is to provide victims with a complete understanding of their rights in as respectful and, a, and dignified a manner as possible. Uh, I think I mentioned that um, there are uh, suggestions. Of, if I were to, um, to talk about a hypothetical case, Assume the following, if, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, a father shoots and kills his two minor children, one in grade school, one in preschool, and then he tries to kill himself. The police arrest the father, they forward the case to the county attorney's office, and as victim counsel, we would typically, under these circumstances, if we hear about the offense early, we would become involved informally as soon as we are able to uh, best practice would be to meet with family members, explain that we're available to walk them through what to expect in the criminal justice system, and then we, um, on indictment, would act as their counsel of record and single point of contact as any questions arise, if the state needs to meet with them, uh, if they are asked to uh, give any type of opinions on the type of, uh, whether it's capital offense or not. At the appropriate time after indictment, we file a notice of appearance and, and certainly would request only contact with our office when addressing victim rights issues. At, uh, uh, at some point, we 
typically would request early on in the process an opportunity to uh, understand what the family members who have lost their loved ones uh, think about capital punishment and make sure we understand that. And in order to discuss the uh, implications of capital punishment, we have to explain the criminal justice system process and the differences between capital litigation and litigation leading to the nat- to a natural life sentence, differences in the length of time to carry out the sentence. In Arizona, like I said, it's uh, it could be anywhere from 12 to 20 years to carry out a capital case, uh, less, per- less amount of time in a non-capital case. And we'd have to talk a little bit about the types of appeals and possible post- conviction evidentiary hearings, limits on victim impact evidence, whether a judge versus jury makes a decision about penalties. Uh, and we also make various recommendations right, out, right at the outset to victims. Keep a, a, keep a diary, keep a log of mileage to and from court or visits with counselors, meetings with attorneys, uh, It might sound trivial, but mileage to and from a a meeting or to and from court is recoverable later as restitution for economic loss. Keep a diary about the uh, nature of the relationship with the children. Describe them as best as you can. Use photographs to introduce them and, and and show their relationships. We talk about that early on in the case. Uh, some, sometimes that's helpful and therapeutic. And in this diary, describe the loss and its effect on uh, the victim's clients that we represent. We also think it's important early on in the process to describe likely issues that would come up during discovery, the likelihood that a defense attorney would request an interview or record, medical records or counseling records, the likelihood that potential uh, motions would be filed requesting a bond uh, reduction hearing so that the defendant might uh, post a bond and get out of custody if it's not a capital case. Typically in a capital case, these are non-bondable offenses. We would describe the nature and length of time to carry out punishment, like I mentioned, uh, the evidentiary hearings, Uh, We would confirm with the victim that the state can consider victim input but does not necessarily have to follow it when making decisions about capital punishment, plea offers, the range of punishment or sentence. Uh, Clearly, we understand and we need to communicate with our clients that the state does not represent them, the victim, and instead may have different considerations at issue. After describing the process, at that point, we try to meet with prosecutors and um, and do so early on in the process to give input on the victim's opinion about capital punishment or potential plea offers or issues with respect to uh, bond uh, bond reduction hearings or or restitution. Uh, We would typically express our uh, clients' opinions on whether to impose capital punishment though right away and understand that uh, that type of information in our jurisdiction is helpful for the state to use when evaluating and staffing a case as Arizona protocols would allow. Uh, victim impact or victim input into the punishment process is a part of but not the sole determining factor in whether to uh, consider capital punishment. But then if the state does consider capital punishment, um, I think I mentioned earlier in the slides, uh, we would typically want to request that opportunity to review mitigation evidence if somehow some expert witness material will um, uh, affect a, uh, a diminished capacity defense, for example. And the argument that we have advanced in, in other cases is that we cannot confer about potential plea offers or trial issues without understanding what it is that the defense is going to present at trial. And mitigation evidence and information is uh, essential to make that understanding 
and we typically would also offer, uh, if it's highly confidential information, we would offer to enter into a uh, uh, confidentiality agreement to protect such information from disclosure. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm probably running out of time here, so I, I I'd like to thank everyone for at least allowing me to go over some uh, recommended best practices when it comes to crime victim rights. I'd like to open it up for some questions and then uh, see if there's any uh, anything further that we can do to, to, to help facilitate victim rights across, uh, across the country. If there are questions that come up, feel free to give us a call at any time. Thank you, Mr. Yeoman, for your presentation. And thank you to our attendees today for being here. Um, we do have some time for question and answer, so if you have a question for our presenter, please type it into the Q&A box on your uh, right-hand side of the screen, or you can also email it to the BJA NPAC website, also on the screen. Uh, we will read your question out loud and have the presenters answer it that way. All participants will remain on listening-only mode. We'll give a few minutes to see what questions we get. So we do have one question. Can a victim be forced to testify by prosecution if the victim is unwilling? Uh, I think uh, that, that's a great question. And um, victims have the right to refuse an interview request from a defense attorney. However, the law in my jurisdiction is a bit unclear as to whether the victim must uh, uh, not be uh, given the opportunity to present or testify when asked by a prosecutor or subpoenaed by a prosecutor. Uh, clearly the law in Arizona as it exists now is that victims have the right to refuse an interview. It's, a, it's unclear whether the same right holds true when a prosecutor makes that same request and they don't want to participate. I would argue that the constitutional protections that victims have prevent them from uh, being forced to, test to testify by way of a subpoena, but I'm not certain that my, my analysis is uh, going to be upheld if, uh, if the issue were to come in front of a state court judge or the Court of Appeals in Arizona. Thank you for that question. I think that's a good one. Yes, thank you. We have a couple more and continue to submit any questions that come to mind. Um, the next one is, what is the most difficult part about representing victims' rights when it comes to interacting with the prosecution? How can we as prosecutors avoid this pitfall? Uh, I, the way I look at it is when a victim actually has an opportunity to obtain counsel, my job is to try and make it easier for you folks as prosecutors moving forward. Uh, the difficulties that I see are when victims don't believe that they have received sufficient information about what's going on, and they have, a, they have questions on why a particular hearing is occurring or why the process is taking so long. And those types of questions, when counsel's involved, victim counsel, uh, can be easier to address than when an attorney's not involved and the victim doesn't have any direction uh, and doesn't have an attorney that directly represents them as well. Uh, I think prosecutors can help the process when it comes to victims, either when they're represented or not, by making themselves available to answer questions uh, as periodically, or at least periodically. If it's with, uh, with attorneys, I would say uh, set up a meeting early on in the process, as early on to answer whatever questions uh, come up to describe the process. I would say do that early on in the process have a victim uh, and victim attorney meeting early on, and I think that that could alleviate uh, unanswered questions down the, down the road. 
and, and certainly hope that uh, uh, as victim rights lawyers, we can also help prosecutors in the process by only limiting follow-up questions to what uh, remains after we explain the process to the victims that we represent. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, my, my advice is early on in the process, meet with victims and talk about expected expectations, time, and uh, time it takes to get a conviction and, and the types of information that could come up in uh, impact statements and, and restitution issues. I would talk through the whole process early on. That's my best suggestion. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have maybe one final question. Um, that would be, if prosecutors can take away one thing from your presentation today with regards to victim rights and victim counsel, what should it be? I think the most important victim rights are the intangible right to fairness, dignity, and respect throughout the criminal justice system how a prosecutor can ensure that they work toward a conviction and still uphold those constitutional rights to uh, treat a victim fairly, to treat a victim respectfully, and with dignity. Because the folks that uh, we represent never have asked to put themselves through the criminal justice system. It was thrust upon them. And the least that I can do as a victim rights lawyer, and I hope prosecutors can do as uh, they seek a conviction of the defendant, is to go through the process in a way that treats victims as fairly as they can, as dignified as they can, and as respectfully as they can as they make their way toward getting a conviction. That's the one takeaway that I uh, would uh, like to respectfully request that all prosecutors think about as they uh, obtain or as they prosecute cases. And I appreciate having the chance to talk about these issues today and, and very much appreciate the time to uh, speak with everyone about these issues. Well, thank you very much. It seems that was our last question, so we can begin to wrap it up. But I do want to say that if you have a question following uh, the conclusion of today's presentation, please feel free to send your question to the BJA NCAT email address on the screen, and we'll make sure to get that question answered for you. So again, thank you very much to our presenters, and thank you to all of our attendees for being here today. We will be sending a follow-up email with a copy of today's presentation and make the link available to the recording when it's available. At the end, you'll see that you're going to be directed to a survey uh, we really uh, would appreciate if you could provide any feedback. Um, and again, thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>